Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming out. I am so honored to be here to have the opportunity to share with you this afternoon. I want to start today with just a brief excerpt from the prologue of Choosing Hope. Ever since I was a little girl and my mom introduced me to Robert Frost, I have loved the poem, The Road Not Taken. In that poem, Frost famously wrote, I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere ages and ages hence, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. When I reached a crossroads in my journey back from that terrible day in 2012, I chose hope, and that has made all the difference. My name is Caitlin Roig de Bellis, and this is my story. In choosing hope, I share with you my story. I also share the power of choice. There is a choice you have to make in everything you do, so keep in mind that in the end, the choice you make makes you. In Choosing Hope, I share four key components that I have found to be crucial in my own life. They each revolve around choice, choosing your purpose, knowing it, following it, choosing your perspective on how to view the world around you, choosing to overcome your own hard times, and choosing hope within them. Our lives are all about choice, and the choice is each of ours alone to make. In sharing these key components, I share with you a piece of my story. My story as a teacher, as a learner, as a leader, my story as a survivor. I share it with you because I know that it will make a difference in how you view each minute, each moment, each day, when you are truly aware that your life can change in an instant. I share it with you because in our lives, we each have a very definite purpose. Choosing your purpose. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. Pablo Picasso. I want to share with you a little bit about what my purpose has always meant to me, is it has always been at the core of everything I have done. I stand with you today as a first grade teacher, as someone who has taught for 10 years, seven in the traditional classroom setting, and three abroad. What's at the core of this is I've known my purpose since the age of five. I started following it at the age of 10 as a mother's helper, a babysitter, a camp counselor, camp counselor monitor, daycare facilitator, youth volunteer, reading buddy, mentor, athlete tutor, study hall monitor, student teacher, intern, and at long last, a teacher. I want to share with you just a snippet about what being a teacher has always meant to me, as it has always been my purpose. And as I share my own, I would encourage you to reflect upon yours. Being a teacher means giving of yourself to your students. It means making someone else's life richer. As a teacher, I know that it is the first of my jobs in a long list of titles. I am my student's support, their educator, their mentor, at times even their parent. More importantly, though, I am happy to be each of these things, to wear each of these hats. I welcome that responsibility with open arms. As a teacher, I am the difference maker in my students' lives. I intervene when two of my students aren't seeing eye to eye. I enable a student struggling with self-image to find something to feel good and confident about. I build a caring community within my classroom where everyone feels safe and welcome and part of the team. I was asked about a year ago, what would the world we live in be like without teachers? If we pause for a second, what would our world be like without teachers? When I was asked this question, without any hesitation, I replied that it simply wouldn't work. Teachers are the common denominator in our world. Every single person started in school. You and I did, doctors do, lawyers, businessmen and women, leaders of country, presidents, prime ministers started in school. And it was teachers who enabled their dreams to come to fruition. Teachers are, in fact, why the world works. I always knew that this was my dream. My childhood dream did become a reality, and my story may be quite similar to yours. Choosing your perspective. We are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Oscar Wilde. I was born on October 31st, 1983. 
Although being that I am adopted, I did not meet my parents until nearly two months later on December 23rd, or Kate's Day, as my parents aptly named it. My parents awoke that morning filled with so much excitement and anticipation to pick up their baby girl whom they had waited so long for. And yet upon waking that morning, they found that my dad's mother, who lived with them at the time in her older age, had passed away in her sleep, a completely tragic morning. And yet the morning they were to become parents, this moment that they had anticipated and waited for for so long, I asked my parents a few years ago what that afternoon was like bringing me home. And they both paused to reflect that upon bringing me home that afternoon, they sat on the couch for hours, passing me back and forth, back and forth, and crying, asking one another, are these tears of joy or tears of sadness? They answered one another quite honestly, they were both. I choose to begin my story here with you today because the day I went home with my parents is a true example of the balance found in life. There are highs and lows. There is good and bad. On any one day, in any one moment, both are always present. It is a choice which to focus on. I have always considered being adopted my greatest blessing. We know that the greatest gifts in life are not objects, things, or possessions. Someone somewhere selflessly gave me up so that I may have the life I so deserved. And that was always the way I viewed being adopted as the most positive thing. My parents provided me with all the love, care, and support in the world. From a young age, I knew I was very blessed, and I was very, very thankful to them for that. They taught me two lessons that I carry with me to this very day. The first is that we each have many gifts to give and that it is our responsibility to give them. The second is that everyone has a story. Everyone came from somewhere and has a varied perspective on how to view the world around them and that we each need to be good listeners in order to hear one another's stories. As I said, my story of wanting to be a teacher begins at the age of five. I was always so curious about the other children I saw at the mall, the movies, the park. I remember at five quite seriously asking my father if I could babysit for the little boy who lived next door, who was three. When my father replied that this wouldn't be possible, I didn't understand. I knew my purpose, and I wanted so desperately to follow it. I grew up likely just like you, this desire we have at five and six years of age to grow up, to be just like our parents, to act out our adult lives. For myself, that acting out meant rows and rows of stuffed animals. I used to be a brunette when I was five sitting in front of me or around me, letting me teach them all different things, always modeling myself after my own incredible teachers. I continued acting out my adult life, playing teacher, pretending that I was throughout my youth and adolescence until at long last, at the age of 17, it was time to leave for the University of Connecticut. I applied to the NEAC School of Education and was accepted. I worked as an athlete tutor, a study hall monitor at the child labs with two and three year old students. Finally, at long last, at the age of 22, my dream was finally realized. I graduated with my master's in elementary education. I was hired as a first grade teacher. As all first year teachers know, I spent the month of August busily readying my classroom. I hung bright posters and birthday charts, busless. I wanted everyone who entered our classroom to feel as warm and welcome as I did. The end of August arrived and Miss Roy, room 12, was on the poster outside of the door. I could not have been more proud. 18 first graders filed into our classroom. I don't know who was more excited, them or me. We spent our first day learning the routines of our classroom and our school. We learned each other's names. We shared about our summers. We ate lunch in the cafeteria for the very first time. It was official. We were a class. And the dream was even more incredible than I could have ever imagined. I spent the next seven years gaining multiple experiences. I worked with my grade level team, refined curriculum. I started a running club for third and fourth grade students called Marathon Mondays. I did as all teachers do. Kept learning and growing to better serve my students and do my job. I started my seventh year teaching happier than I had ever been. 
I had just gotten engaged on August 18th, and life and its possibilities seemed truly endless. The year was passing rapidly, filled with so much excitement and anticipation. As you know, when you are engaged to marry the love of your life, it is a daily countdown. 320, 242, 180. On December 14th, 2012, that countdown came to a screeching halt. Choosing to overcome. I have never felt that anything really mattered, but the satisfaction of knowing that you stood for the things in which you believed and had done the very best you could. Eleanor Roosevelt. That morning I awoke ready to tackle the day. It was Friday and the weekend lay in front of me. As I hurried to leave, something stopped me in my tracks. I put down my things, grabbed my phone, and walked over to the slider as the sun began rising peacefully over Long Island Sound. I took a picture of that site, I posted it to Facebook, and I raced out the door. Not even three hours later, my sense of peace, calm, and happiness were forever changed. As my students and I sat in our morning meeting in the first classroom in our school, we had just finished greeting one another. We had just finished, or were in the midst, excuse me, actually, of sharing our holiday traditions when very loud, rapid fire shooting began over and over and over. As our classroom was the first in the school, there was not a moment of hesitation. I knew immediately what I was hearing. The possibility that your life can change in an instant is of course always there, sometimes fortuitously so and others not. I'm sure that you can relate to this. Leaving your home moments before it burns to the ground, changing lanes before avoiding a head-on collision, a miraculous healing after suffering a terrible illness. The change of course can be for the worse. A loved one unexpectedly passing, your car being sideswiped on the highway in a terrible accident, an angry man entering a school whose only intention is to take as many innocent lives as possible. I knew that something very evil was in imminent proximity of my students and myself. Time was of the essence. How do you make a split second decision in the second that you need to? For myself, the only decision that needed to be made was do I want us to survive? The only answer to that was yes. If we were going to hide, survive, we had to hide. The only option at hiding in our classroom was a tiny, single occupancy bathroom stall built for a small child, a six or seven year old. Until that day, I had never stepped foot inside of it. It was simply too small for a grown adult to fit. However, in that moment, the impossible needed to become possible. We began running, rushing, running to the back of our classroom. Shots ringing out all around us as if we were at war on a battlefield. Our actual colorful, bright, vibrant classroom faded immediately. I began picking my students up. I placed one child on top of the toilet two children on top of the toilet, one student behind on top of where the flusher is. I sat one little girl on top of the toilet paper dispenser holding her with my arm until we were finally all in. When we were finally in, the door to our space opened in. Having never been inside it until that day, I didn't realize that the door opened in, so we were in and I could not close the door. I began picking students up and putting them behind until eventually we were able to close the door and lock it. We waited. We stood there huddled, squished like sardines, listening to the sheer terror of what was happening on the other side of our bathroom hideout. Pure evil reigned on the other side of a cinder block. My students looked up at me and said, I want my mom. I don't want to die today. I really want to celebrate Christmas. I said, I know, and it's going to be OK. I did not think it was going to be OK. The sounds were horrifying to me as an adult, and I could not even begin to fathom what my students at six and seven must have been thinking and experiencing. So in a moment that you're sure is your last, where you are surrounded by babies, what are you supposed to do? I told them how lucky I was to be their teacher, how happy I was that they were in my class, how proud of them I was, and how much I loved each of them. And the shooting continued all around us. It's an interesting thing. When our lives present us with a really difficult, hard time, there is almost always an element of waiting involved. 
I'm sure that you can relate to this. You're diagnosed with cancer. You wait for remission. You are in an accident and you wait for your prognosis. A loved one dies and you wait for the unbearable pain to somehow be lifted. Waiting is the supreme unknown. There are many unanswered questions. Will it be okay? Will it all turn out all right? Is someone watching out for me? In waiting, I realized two things. I realized I could choose my thoughts and I realized I could choose to have faith. In waiting, the impact of my thoughts was huge. I had to think positive, hopeful, uplifting thoughts, thoughts that we would make it through. I had to choose to have faith. As I stood surrounded by my precious six and seven-year-old students, I thought of my fiance. I thought of the wedding dress that was hanging in the shop already bought. I thought of the beach we were to be married on the following August 16th, 2013. And in that moment, I realized I cannot leave him. He will not be okay. He will not recover from this. What do you do when all of your control has been taken from you? Where you are surrounded by children who are in your care, 15 of them, what on earth is there to do? In that moment, I told my students, if you believe in the power of prayer, we need to pray together right now. And if you believe in something else at home with your families, you need to imagine the very best. We all closed our eyes. Some of us prayed and some of us imagined the very best. And the shooting continued all around us. Soon afterward, the shooting stopped. An extremely eerie silence took over. There was no relief in it. My students once again began to ask if we could get out, if they could lead the way. I again said we were waiting for someone to come and get us out. We absolutely were not going to open that door. Eventually, after about 45 minutes, a knock came, and as you would reply to a small child, the voice said, hey, little buddy, little fella, can you please open the door? It's the police, and we're here to help you. We want to help you. At that point, I had spoken. I said, if you're the police, I need your badge. They immediately slid it under the door, and as I held it in my hand, after what my students and I had heard and lived through, I could not believe. I said, this does not look real. I do not believe you. If you are really the police, you need to have the keys to open this door. They did have the master set of keys, and they tried a bunch of different ones until eventually the door pushed in. We were greeted by an entire SWAT team in our classroom. I used to say to audiences at this point in my story that I will absolutely never know who was more surprised by the sight they saw, us or them. However, last summer in New Jersey, in the United States, I was speaking to a wonderful audience of educators, and afterward, a woman came up to me at the lunch, and she said, I want you to know that my husband's best friend led that SWAT team into your classroom that day, and he's the one who pushed in that door. It was not until that moment that I realized we had survived and that I was not in heaven. I am so grateful to her for sharing that with me. In the days and weeks following December 14th, I was left reeling, struggling to regain control for my students and myself and grappling with the whys. Why did this happen? Why our school? Why? Eventually, I came to realize I was never going to answer those whys. Not then, not now, not ever. And that instead, I needed to shift my energy onto questions that could be answered. And for myself, there were two, two questions I absolutely had to answer. The first was, how do I make sure this day does not come to define my students and myself? The second was, how do we get our control back? Those two questions became my guiding light. They drove me in absolutely every single thing that I did. Sometimes in our lives, during the really dark times, we tend to focus so much energy on the whys, on the questions that we are never going to answer, and we forget there are so many questions we can. And for myself, those two questions became everything to myself and to my path of healing. When you go through a really dark time, the essence of time it doesn't change it. It doesn't diminish it. It is there. It is always. It is constant. All one can do is to make a conscious choice to focus on the abundant good that is also all around. Do you curse the rain or do you praise it because it brings you beautiful flowers? Are you always yearning for the grass that is on the other side of the fence or can you learn to appreciate the grass under your own two feet? Optimism is a choice and it's each of our choice alone to make. 
When I thought of my students, this is them at the beginning of January when we returned to our new school, I knew that we had a very big choice to make. If after all the evil we had endured, we were going to instead choose to focus on the positive and on hope, then I as their teacher had a very big question to answer and that was how? Choosing hope. Hope is being able to see that there is light despite all of the darkness. Desmond Tutu. When we returned to our new school, one of the most uplifting things was that we were inundated with gifts. Gifts from around the world came into our classroom, and after giving and giving and giving to my kids, I realized that if I did not take it as a teachable moment to teach my kids that in life when you get, you have to give, that I was doing a huge disservice. And so one day, about a week and a half back to school, I decided that was the day that we were going to pay it forward. And so we reached out to a class. We asked, how can we help? They said, we would love a Mimeo Teach, which is like a smart board that hangs on the wall and streams from the computer. We mailed them the money to buy that for their classroom. And as you can see, they were very thankful. They then felt inspired by our kindness and reached out to a class in Arizona and mailed them whiteboards and markers and erasers. And those were the initial three classrooms involved in this concept for the nonprofit organization classes for classes. In choosing hope, it led me in a new and hopeful direction. In choosing hope, it led me to continue to be engaged in what I love, helping children to be successful, making sure that they learn a social, emotional intelligence. Because in choosing hope, evil can never define my students or myself. I want to share with you just a few very, very quickly, and I'll just scroll through. I won't talk about them because I know we're getting close. These are actual projects from C4C students talking about kindness and compassion and empathy. Kindness posters, pen pal letters, kindness campaigns, book studies, character trait studies, a tag sale where the students raised $800 for their very own project. As I look to the future, I'm filled with many feelings, the greatest of which is hope. Hope is the reason we get out of bed every single morning. It's the reason we're all here today. Hope is the reason we embark on any task, job, or mission. I hope for a healthy and happy life with my husband. We wed on August 16th, 2013. I hope to continue spreading classes for classes across the United States, as is in one of my favorite childhood books, The Best Laid Plans Can Often Falter. I could have never planned for the tragic events of December 14th and after found myself on a very new path with no plan. When I found myself there, I made two choices that made all the difference. That day would not define us and we would get our control back. In making those two choices, they led me in a new and hopeful direction to found classes for classes, to speak to educators, administrators, and amazing audiences just like you, to write Choosing Hope. We each have that power in our lives to choose our purpose, choose our perspective always as a positive one, choose to always overcome whatever is put in our path, and to choose hope inside of it. Our lives are all about choice, and the choices are each of ours alone to make. I would be happy to answer any and all comments and questions that you may have for me. Good day. Um, you've mentioned, as you spoke, the evil of this shooting. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it seems that, I mean, it definitely was evil, there's no doubt about it, what he did. But was he ill? Um, you know, I often say that the people sure. who go to prison in our community sure. are the sad, the mad, and the bad, sure. and there's very few bad. Sure. And when I took my little toddlers into the prison once, they said, Dad, are these all bad people? I said, no, they're sure. people who've done bad things. Sure, sure. Um, I, I, I believe that he was. I don't know, and I also don't care. When you make a decision to take 26 innocent lives, 20 of them six and seven-year-olds, your story no longer matters. Yes, ma'am. 
You said you had a feeling uh, at a very early age that you wanted to help other mm -hmm. kids, you wanted to babysit. You were obviously very fortunate in the parents that adopted you, very lucky indeed. Did you ever analyse, did you ever find out who your yeah. uh, genetic parents sure were? Did. And did you ever analyse how you had that feeling at such an early age? Sure. Great, great questions. Twofold there. Uh, yes, when I was 23, my birth family found me. They had been actively seeking to find me pretty much since they gave me up. My birth parents married, and I have a full blood sister, nine years almost to the day younger than me. Uh, my entire life, they lived 20 miles down the road. Um, they're wonderful and lovely. They're not my parents, but they're lovely and um, in, in their own regard. Uh, for myself, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure where it came from innately, but from the time my parents told me when I was two and a half, um, I always thought of it as my biggest blessing that somebody had not been able to take care of me, was too young, what have you. I, I always put that scenario in my mind that she just couldn't take care of me for whatever reason and that she so selflessly went through an entire pregnancy and brought me into this world and gave me the life that I did so deserve. Because um, what would the alternative have been? Well, they're my parents. Uh, yeah, that, <laughs> this, this, that, yeah, that um, maybe inculcated that into you in a kind of um, unconscious way, you know, just yeah. by example, I think. So, yeah, so, well, I think so. what was really helpful, too, probably, is my dad asked me at least once a year, if not more, it was actually quite annoying, if he wanted to help me find them. Yeah, and I never did. So finally, when I was about 10, he stopped asking. But um, <laughs> so very open. Hello. Hello. Um, thank you for the lovely talk. It was fantastic. I just want to know what your views on uh, the US gun laws are. And um, because this is not really a one, it's, well, perhaps it's one off in its uh, intensity, but this is happening with, uh, in a regular fashion uh, over there. Do you? Do you have strong views either way on, on Well, it? I will say, I, I've got every single audience I've spoken to has asked me this, and um, I completely understand why. I will first start by saying that I am just as bewildered and, um, <coughs> and confused by the fact that nothing has been done, so to speak. So that's not, I live in the US and I, I don't feel that same way. I absolutely do. Um, I am an educator. So that's my training. Um, that's what I have my master's and two honorary doctorates in. I know how to help kids be successful, and I know how to help them to have a social emotional intelligence so that hopefully there isn't room for hatred and misunderstanding in our world. Uh, I am so hopeful that those in a place of um, power and control within our country, politicians and policymakers, can continue to have the conversations until a common sense, gun sense resolution is, is um, had, because it is quite evident that something needs to be done on a very large scale. Um, it's simply not my wheelhouse. I don't know what that answer is. I didn't go into politics. You know, I went in to help kids be successful and to learn. So that's what I, you know, that's the part I can play. Yeah. But I'm hopeful that what they need to do will be done. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm presuming that you were an only child and it's often with only children they can get rather spoiled. So how come you managed to avoid all this? Oh gosh, that's great. Um, great question. Um, well, I think, well, first I had to, have you read Choosing Hope? Sorry. Have you read Choosing Hope? Or not? Okay, okay. Um, so you'll read about my parents a bit in there. Um, I think I had a very, very good balance. Uh, my dad very much doted on me and, and gave me the world. And my mom very much made me work for every single little thing. Um, and so I was definitely taught, you know, I started volunteering when I was nine. Um, and did so throughout, you know, my, my high school, middle school, and college years. Um, so I think I, from a very early age, my dad, even though he gave me a lot, he instilled that when you have a lot in life, that that's your responsibility to give even more. Um, and so that's just always been a part of, of the way I was raised and who, and who I am now. Yeah, they taught me that, yes, we can give you a lot, but a lot of people don't have a lot, and so it's your responsibility to then help them. Thank you. I will tell them. <laughs> I'm so sorry we have run out of time, but I know we have a I'll couple keep of asking. extra questions, so we might just, we'll take the one at the front row and then the fourth row. 
Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm wondering about classes for classes and yes. how that's been received yeah. across the United States. My understanding is that there's great variances uh, between regions, between different departments and systems. Yeah. And if it's been sort of universally welcomed, what your experience has been, uh, what the year levels, and ju just how it's been received, I suppose. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. We um, so far have been in 10 states. And we've worked with um, a little over 1,500 students, certainly not where I would like us to be. Nonprofit, at least in the United States, is a very slow moving process. We are you know, just about two and a half years young. Um, we've had a ton of support from not just educators, but outside people who really believe in what we're doing and have shared the message um, across our nation. And we're so hopeful to be in all 50 states, so we have 40 more to take on. Um, you know, I, I would say that we're by no means where I want us to be, but that's why I continue to, to go out and to speak and to uh, work with different administrators and school boards across the country. And certainly, as you said, it does very much vary state to state and even district to district, what is allowed, what they have time for. Um, but that, it was really important to us in building classes for classes. We're an online uh, nonprofit, so classrooms come on and they can use their project page how they best see fit. You know, there's no right or wrong, and we're not a um, explicit curriculum, purposely so, because we didn't want to exclude anyone. Um, so, and we're hopeful to come to Australia. We're very hopeful. Yes. Oh, thanks. Um, hello. Hello. I'm, I was wondering about your class and yes. if you have had contact with of them. Of course, yeah. And yes. how they're going. Yes, well, you can't answer any um, question of how someone's doing um, in the community in any blanket statement. You know, I can't say everyone's great or everyone's terrible. Um, healing is a long process and there are peaks and valleys and certainly we are all still going through it. I am so grateful that I am definitely still in touch with the majority of my students. Um, two of my students, three, moved away. One lost her twin brother on that day. Um, I keep in touch with her family via um, Facebook. Most of my students, though, are still in that school. I'm very close with my room mom from that year and so her and I have, you know, catch-ups um, once every two months. I saw the majority, 13 of my students, in December. I saw six of them a month ago. Um, you know, we landed today and I went on my Facebook and my room mom had just posted a picture of her daughter's fourth grade picture because they're so big now. But um, no, I'm so grateful to, to be a part of their lives. But every year, my kids are my kids. My first class 10 years ago are my kids. And I'll always think of them that way. But I'm really grateful that their families um, allow me to be a part of their life. It's so important. Yeah. They're great. I really encourage you all to pick up a copy of Choosing Hope at the back of the room and please uh, join me in thanking Caitlin for her Thank talk today. Thank you all for being here.